Praise the Lord. Why don't you put your hands together? Aren't you glad to be here this snowy Sunday morning? There's no better place to be on a snowy Sunday morning than in the house of the Lord. Can the church say amen? Amen. We are so happy to be here, and we are so happy to receive a special guest today, a special speaker, Brother Caleb Worley. I've had the opportunity now a few times to meet him, and he just is a delight. We're so thankful uh, for what he's brought in the first service, and I know what he's going to bring in this second service. But he's an international evangelist traveling over 70 countries now, spreading the word of God. Amen? And he has a word, I believe, for us today. Can the church say amen? So at this time, why don't we give him a big His Church welcome. Why don't you stand to your feet? Brother Caleb Worley, we love you. Come on, give Jesus a hand this morning. I feel awake, you look awake, and we're in the right place. Just remain standing. Are you excited this morning? You look happier than you did the last time I saw you. You look skinnier than you did the last time I saw you. Some of you have been fasting. Just looking at you guys. You guys are the faithful ones, even those of you in the balcony. You made it through the snow. Such a joy to be with you guys. Uh, I want us to pray over the time we have together and over Pastors Brian and Jesse as they're in Missouri, I believe somewhere in Missouri, Ozark. They were doing a conference yesterday for couples uh, at one of the King's churches over there, and then they'll be ministering today, and we want to lift them up in prayer. You know, it takes a lot to leave a good place and to go and sow in another place, but the Bible promises that as we sow, we will also reap. And so we're believing with them and also with this church that every time they have an assignment and they go to sow in another man's field, that God is going to expand their field. And God's going to expand the work of their hands here in this place that you're a part of. And so though you may miss them at times when they go, they're on a divine assignment. They're sowing. They're leaving their children to lead worship and to play. And I saw the camera lady. Where are you back there? The littlest one of the Gibson clan with their camera. And so all of them are involved. But you know what? It's a sacrifice to leave your family and to go somewhere else. But the Bible says that as you sow, you will also reap. It also says that when you give up things in this life, that you will also receive much more in this life, it says now and in the age to come, that God will bring increase. And so that's what we're believing for this church, for Pastors Brian and Jesse and their family. Can we lift them up in prayer today? Father, I thank you for Pastors Brian and Jesse. I thank you for their family. Thank you for the leadership of this church. Bless them today as they're ministering your word as they've been faithful for the assignment that you have for them. I thank you for that strong anointing upon their lives to deliver the word with boldness, Lord, with confidence, with prophecy, and with signs, wonders, and miracles following the work of the ministry. And I pray, God, that as they're sowing in another man's field, that you're going to increase their territory and their field here in this place. We pray for the churches in Kentucky and Henderson and Owensboro. And we thank you, Father, for what you're doing through this church, how you're using this church to reach a region, to touch lives, and to help people to find you. Lord, bless them today. And Lord, bless us as we're here. I pray a blessing upon each person. Lord, give us ears to hear and eyes to see what you're telling us and what you're showing us in this hour. Help us not just leave this place with a touch or an encounter, but help us leave this place with marching orders, with instruction, with clarity, with assignments, so that we can see heaven invade this earth through our lives because of our obedience. And we'll be quick to give you all the honor in all that you do, because we recognize that apart from you, we can't do it. But with you, we can do all things. So we declare that today in this place, all things are possible because we believe. If you believe that today, put your hands together for Jesus one more time. Amen. Well, give two people a high five and tell them to get ready. You made it through the snow. You may as well get all that God has for you. And you can be seated. 
I'm not sure all the direction of where we're going to go today, but we're going to get somewhere. Tell the person next to you, we're going to get somewhere. If you're ready. Scripture says in Isaiah 1 and verse 19, if you are willing and obedient, you'll eat the good of the land. Another translation says, you're willing and obedient, you'll have the best in life. How many of you want the best in life? Even if the microphone. Hello? Hello? You want the best in life? So this is where I believe God is taking you. You know, you've been in this season, these moments of revival. How many of you have been in some of the special revival services? Good job leading worship. Where's my champ at? What's up, man? Good to see you, buddy. You've been in these services where God is moving. You've been getting individual words. You've had encounters. You've been filled up. I mean, you got the oil. I think about that story where it says, you know, they ran out of vessels and then the oil ceased. And I thought in his church, you're never going to run out of vessels because <laughs> you guys got more vessels than I've ever seen in any church anywhere in the world. So there's plenty of vessels, plenty of oil. But you've been in this season where you've had these encounters and it's changing you but it also wants to change what God does through you. Because there's a harvest out there. There's a world that's lost, it's dying, it's hurting, it's broken, it's bound, it's addicted. And we get set free so we can help others to be set free. And I believe that God wants to take you into a new dimension, into a new season, and to a new level. And the question that, as I was praying on the drive over here, five hours from Tulsa yesterday, as I was just praying, God, what do you want them to, set, to hear? What do you want to say to them? And what's the question that you have for them that they need to begin to answer? And I feel like the Holy Spirit said, ask them the question, who told them they're in a season of waiting? Who told them it will take X amount of years before they get that breakthrough? Who told them they'll be at this age when they get that financial level? Who told them that their business will grow to this size when they get to, you know, this season of life? Who told them they're in a season of waiting? I thought, okay, I'll ask them. I don't know who told them, but I guess it wasn't the Lord. Isn't it interesting? We can have an encounter with God. We can have words from God, but then we take our natural instincts to figure out how God's going to do something. We get a word, increase, expansion. You're going to grow and multiply. Okay, thank you, Lord. Then you go back home. You're like, okay, how am I going to multiply? All right, I guess I'm at this level, and I'll be at this level. And I've done this. There's, there's, I remember several years ago, now I, I'm from Oklahoma. It's kind of flat and dry, similar to here. It just doesn't smell as much like manure. We don't have the, well, as many cows. But I went to a beach, this is years ago, and I felt like the Lord says, will you believe me? And I thought, yeah, I'll believe you. Believe that someday you could have a place here that you come to visit and you look at the beach because it refreshes you. And I thought, well, the Lord gives us the desires of our heart. I guess if God wants me to have a house on a beach someday, I'll believe for it. At least somewhere I can see the water. So I said, okay, Lord. And then I went down a few weeks later and I thought, I wonder at what time in my life God wants to provide that. And I put a time frame. The time frame hasn't happened yet, so I don't have that house on the beach anywhere yet. But I'm just sharing this story because I got a vision, a dream. I got something I felt like the Lord says, okay, I want to give that to you. And then I put a natural timeline on when I thought it would be capable, probable, if my finances got to this level at this season. It was, I even put an age bracket. I said, okay, when I get to this age, I believe I will see the fulfillment of that promise. And I didn't think there was anything wrong with that. And then a little while later, I felt like the Lord says, why did you want to limit what I wanted to do? And so often, we can put a natural limitation on a supernatural word, and we can explain it away by saying something religious like, I'm waiting on God. Brother, 
How are you? I'm just waiting on the Lord. And it sounds like a good thing. Like, sure, we should be waiting on the Lord. Yeah, praise the Lord. Well, what are you doing about that problem in your family? I'm just waiting on the Lord. Okay, wonderful. What are you going to do about that thing in your finances? Oh, just believing and waiting on the Lord. I felt like the Lord says, why are people blaming me for them not increasing? It's as if we have a que sera, sera. Whatever will be, will be. But this is not the God that we serve. God has clarity, instruction, assignments. In fact, he speaks and he wants his people to obey. So the God that we serve isn't a God that puts limits or time frames and says, okay, yeah, you're right. You, you, will, you will get there when you're at this place. And I realize this because I have some friends who are multimillionaires who are in their 70s. And they have amazing stories. It started out with nothing, with a little cracker box, and then it grew, and then it expanded, and then expanded a little more, and I was faithful, and I sowed. All, I mean, amazing. And you think, wow, that's amazing. Then I started to meet younger guys in their 30s, and they were at similar levels, and I thought, there was an acceleration. They loved God. They did the right things. But somehow, they didn't cap, and God is no respecter of people. And I realize sometimes you can have an expectation, I'm going to get there when, and then you can miss out on some acceleration that God may want to do in your life because you're making an excuse by saying, I'm waiting on God. I'm waiting on God. When are you going to get your breakthrough? Well, I'm just waiting on the Lord. What if you're not waiting on the Lord? What if God's waiting on you? What if God's waiting on you to get clearer instruction on the step you need to take? When I read scripture and Jesus spoke to people, he was looking for them to respond in the moment. Not, he didn't instruct them to say, okay, about two months from now, four years from now, okay, you're going to get this. No, he was ready. He was speaking. And then as people obeyed, they saw miracles take place. We see this also throughout the Old Testament. There is two words, and you'll see them now if I mention them as you read stories. And when God speaks, you'll see this responsive behavior of his people, like to Abraham. He would say, you know, get up from where you are and go to the place where I'll, I will show you. And the scripture says, and he arose and he went. And with Jacob, he said to Jacob, get up and go to Bethel. And the Bible says he arose and he went. And then the New Testament, you see Philip, an evangelist, having a great time in Jerusalem. And the scripture says, you know, I want you to go to the desert, to the, you know, out of the dusty road leading out of Jerusalem. And the scripture says, he arose and he went. I'm just waiting on God. If Philip would have been waiting on God in Jerusalem after he spoke, he never would have met the Ethiopian eunuch that saw a transformation in his life and a whole continent heard about who Jesus was because of one man's obedience. He would have still been sitting in Jerusalem saying, oh, brother, I'm just waiting on God. I mean, he does, he's done a lot of good things, but I'm waiting on him. And then God's like, hey, I already gave you the instruction. I'm waiting on you. What if your next level and your new season isn't as far away as you thought? Shake your head because I can't tell by your face. So I really felt in prayer for you guys as you've been in these encounters and you've getting these prophetic words and you've had supernatural things happening to you to have an expectation that God can accelerate you into that season faster than you think. Write these two words down. New season, new level. God has new seasons for you and he has a new level for you to walk into. In the same way that children, as they're growing up, you manage children at different ages differently. And as they go into a new season, the intake of their life is different. The obedience in their life is different. I have this in my house every single day. I have teenagers and a two-year-old, 18, 16, and two. I know you're wondering what happened to my life. It's the same thing you went through. It's called the pandemic. This guy 
has it three times, four, two, and one, zero. My 16-year-old daughter who just started driving a month and a half ago, ago, I treat her differently and I have expectations of her differently than two-year-old Emma who just runs around the house and does whatever she wants with some instruction and some correction, but she's two. Now, if I took the same measure of parenting from the two-year-old to the 16-year-old, like, hey, I don't care. Drive whatever lane you want to drive. Don't follow the traffic rules. Don't worry about anything. Just do whatever. She wouldn't make it very far. In fact, she would get into a lot of trouble, and it probably would cost her a lot in her life. But at different levels, we behave different. We act different. In the same way in faith, as we grow, what I've experienced is if you're going to go to a new level, you have to think on a different level. You have to eat on a different level. You have to educate yourself on a different level. And there's a new level of obedience that's required when you know certain things in your life. To whom much is given, much is required. Those that are faithful with little, they'll be ruler over much. So God wants us to go into a new season. And he has a desire for us to go to another level. Tell the person next to you another level. But it requires participation on our part. That's why I get back to that question. I asked you, who told you you're in a season of waiting? Because it probably wasn't God. Because God has a desire to expand and enlarge his people on a continual basis. And if we ever get to the place where we say, I'm good, we actually step into the greatest level of selfishness that we could ever be in. Because when we say, I'm okay, I'm good, I'm 60, I'm 40, I'm 20, whatever, I've reached the place, I've experienced the things, then we actually live at a place that's less than God's best because we lose sight of why God wants to expand us and grow us and increase us because it's about reaching people. And you're the most selfish when you live in a place and you say, oh, I'm good, I'm okay, I don't need any more, okay. Don't worry about you, what about people that don't know him? Don't you want to be a greater light so those in darkness can see you and have the testimony like the followers of Jesus in the book of Acts where it says, wow, those people, they've been with Jesus. So why would God want to take you to a new season and a new level? Because there's more people that he wants you to reach. As I stand here today, there's more seats he wants to fill. There's more lost that need to be found. There's more broken that need to be healed. There's more people bound that need to be set free. And the scripture tells us that the assignment of the place where the word of God is preached and the pastor's assignment according to the New Testament is the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry. That tells me that you coming in is about being equipped but the transformation of a region takes place as you go out. Shake your head because I can't tell by your face. So God wants to take you to a new season and a new level so that we can see this region transform with the gospel of Jesus Christ. So that the dry places can be filled. So that the dark places can be lit up. Write this scripture reference down, Joshua chapter 13. In Joshua 13, it's a passage of scripture after the children of Israel had conquered several things. They had seen Jericho defeated, Ai. They've seen the sun stand still. They've seen all these things. But I'm always challenged by Joshua 13 because it says there remains more territory yet to be possessed. There, there is new seasons yet to be possessed. There's new levels for you to go to. And then the scripture says, and this is the territory, verse 2 of Joshua 13, and this is the territory that yet remains. All the territory. Everybody say all. And when you look it up in every translation, it still means the same thing. All. Todo. En español. 
completo. Amigo. It means all. So the desire of God is every lost would be found. Now we know not every person will respond, but every person should have an opportunity to hear. Not every person will open their hearts, but every person should know the direction that they can open their heart and they can be transformed. And God's going to use the people of this church, his church and his church, God's going to use this church to see more lost be found than ever before. That's revival. Revival's not I feel better. Revival is I was changed, now I'm going to help someone else. That's revival. Revival is I had an encounter that was real, that transformed me. Let me tell you about it, what God can do with you. My name was called out. My future was given to me. I had an encounter at an altar. And we can all remember those moments when God wants to take you from an altar to the street so that those people that need to be at an altar can have an encounter with him too. And some of you that own businesses, God doesn't want you just to have a business. He wants you to have a kingdom business that is a light and an example to a region. Where they walk into your business and they don't just see a business, they see people's lives that are being transformed. You start putting pictures of countries and people you help and places that you've been and things that you support. Some of the businesses I go into that are kingdom businesses, you can see the mission, the model, the representation of this is who we are, unashamed, and people see it, know it, and want to know more about it. One friend I have, he lives in Hong Kong. His side business, this is one of his side businesses, is he put the industrial kitchens in every McDonald's across mainland China. Just his side business. That's thousands of McDonald's, in case you didn't know that they had McDonald's in China. They like Big Macs too. I said, why do you feel the need to do some of those kind of things? He said, oh, it's all about kingdom. Because they hire us, we go in, and then we can be who we are. We can tell them, hey, we're not just business people. We've been transformed. Let me tell you about Jesus. Did you know today in mainland China, there are more Christians following Jesus than what we have in America? They have more people, so there's more capacity. But more people have been reached there, not through the pulpit and not through the service, but through the believer. I was sitting in Shanghai one time. Now, I know politically it's not great to talk about China, but that's okay. God doesn't see the geopolitical lines that we draw. He sees the people that he created, that he loves, that he has a plan for. So it's not about politics. This is about people. I was in Shanghai several years ago sitting with some business people. We'd had a service. And afterwards, I said, tell me about the revival that God is doing in China because I've seen hundreds of millions of people that have responded but it's not happening the way that we've seen it in the West. And he said, oh, it's very simple. He said, through the leadership, they tried to stop what God wanted to do, but it actually pushed us to the street to help us do what we actually needed to do. You try to reach people on Sunday, we reach them Monday through Saturday. And he said, it's Monday through Saturday has more capacity to reach more people. Because that's where they live, and that's where they work, and that's where they go to school. And so we just tell people, when we have the opportunity to meet, it's not about us meeting. It's about us being transformed to go and help reach people where we live. And that's when we see transformation. So there are different ways that God has through the instruction of the Holy Spirit. And what we need to be encouraged with is the desire of God is for always more people to be reached. But it doesn't just happen automatically. It requires people to grow in finance. It requires people to go in obedience. It requires more people to pray. It requires more people to worship. It requires more participation. Say participation. I know, like today in the Super Bowl, most of you, I would venture to say in this room, every single one of you are not participating in the game. If so, you wouldn't be here today. There are some people who are participating. They're there in Las Vegas preparing today to play in the game. The rest of you are just spectators, watching, rooting, 
wearing jerseys, but you're still not in the game. I know some of you 55-year-old men wearing the jersey, the pads, you feel like you're still in the game. You're not in the game, can I just tell you? <laughs> I have my jerseys as well. I have an OU jersey. I have a Dallas Cowboys jersey. I pray over both of them often, and it still doesn't help. They let me down every single year. And if you're a in the closet Cowboys fan, just come out of the closet, admit they're not, they're just going to disappoint you. Lower your expectation, be surprised if they win, and we'll all celebrate. Some of you have switched teams. I don't know why. You gave up. The faithful Cowboys fans gave up. And some of you Cowboys fans are even going to root for the 49ers today, which is evil. <laughs> Ungodly. Not his will for your life. Now, if you're a 49ers fan, go for it all day long. But don't switch teams. That's a side note. But in the same way, we sometimes view our life with Christ and Christianity like those games. Like there's a few people chosen to be in the game, and the rest of us are spectators because we sit in a chair. You may spectate in this service because you don't have the microphone, you're not behind the pulpit, but Christianity is not a spectator sport. It's only participation. This is equipping here, okay? So this is like a rally. This is like the locker room before we go out to the big game. So just imagine you each have a jersey for the kingdom of God today. Different colors, different shades, different sizes, different nationalities, different whatever. But you're equipped here. You have the jersey. Now he wants you to go out there and participate in the game of life and win people for Jesus. So back to the question. If this is our assignment, then who told you you're in a season of waiting? I'm waiting on God. What are you waiting on? If the enemy can do anything, if he can't, if the enemy can't keep you from entering into the kingdom of God, his best method is going to be to slow you down and deceive you into thinking you have enough. Okay, just stay content. Why? Because he knows when you understand how the kingdom of God works and how God works, God can accelerate things in your life. You can go to a new level. You can walk into a new season. But it takes something called faith. Say faith. The scripture tells us, and if you're wondering when am I going to get to the message, I don't know. We're getting there. The Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 11, turn there in your Bibles or follow along on the screen or just listen and believe me, it's in the Bible. Hebrews chapter 11, in verse 1, it says, this will help some of you with that excuse, I'm waiting on God. I know it sounds really, really wonderful to make the excuse of why things aren't progressing in your life to blame God. But it doesn't bring change. It just gives you a better excuse as to why things are the same in your life year after year. I'm just waiting on God, brother. Quit blaming God for your inactivity. And start believing God for the instruction on how you need to be active in some area so that you can see change happen. This will show you how God thinks in regards to the swiftness of our obedience as it comes to faith. Hebrews 11.1, 1, what is the first word in that verse? It's an open book test. What is it? Now. Ahora. Is that right? Now. Everybody say now. What's now in Italian, my friend? Ora. Adesso ora. Mozzarella. Buongiorno. Now. Everybody say now. Now faith is. What a great illustration of how faith moves in our lives and how faith is not just supposed to be a stagnant fact in our head. It's supposed to be an action in our life. I'm just trusting God. You've heard this. Now the Bible talks to us and instructs us that this is our roadmap. This 
This is the foundation of our lives. So it's a solid rock. It's the foundation. All those illustrations. But this is not something I just stand on. This is something I move with. Okay, four of you believe that. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. So I'm not just standing, I'm moving. I'm just standing on the word. Wonderful. That gives you a foundation to move. I'm believing God. How do we know you're believing God? By what you do. By the words that you speak and the actions in your life. How do you know someone is standing in faith? I'm just standing in faith. Okay. Show me what you're doing. How are you standing in faith? I'm believing God to expand my business. Well, if you're standing in faith, then God's going to stretch you more than you've ever been stretched before. He's going to require more of you than you've ever been required of before. He's going to ask you to give more than you've ever given before. Isn't that right? You guys just went through the His Honor offering. How did God want to expand your life? By you giving in a greater level. How do we know you're in faith? Because you participated. In the same way, if you want to see God take you to a new level and help you walk into a new season, it's going to require a greater level of faith followed with action than you've ever seen before than you've ever seen before. Because in the time and age that we live, God wants to accelerate things. Say accelerate. How many of you would like God to accelerate some things in your life? What if what you have said, God, you can do this in X amount of years. God says, I can do it in X amount of months. Would your life be better or worse? Better. Shake your head. I can't tell by your face. Right? Life will be better. If some of the things that you say, un dia es posible, what if God says, in, in translation that means one day it's possible, what if instead of one day it's possible, you said, ahora, now, do the work. Set, set me free. Bring the miracle. Open up the doors. Okay, how many of you are with me? So how many of you want this in your life? Okay, let me give you a little path that will help you. So we have the word. We mix it with faith. And then it requires participation. Everybody say participation. So here's your participation. Matthew chapter 7, verse 7. This is entry-level Christianity that is often overlooked because we're asking God for something that he's already told us to do. Give me a sign. I gave you my word. Give me another sign. I gave you my word. Give me a different sign. Just do what I said. It's like children. We are like children. We are like little stupid children many times. Little stupid obedient and disobedient. Sometimes we're obedient. Sometimes we're disobedient. But God loves us anyways. Matthew 7, 7. Here's kind of the instruction if you're wondering where we're going. It's getting you out of this waiting mentality into an expecting mentality, into a manifestation mentality. God didn't tell you you're waiting. He said go. He said now. Faith is. He said give and it shall be given. He said move and I'll move with you. He said go and tell and Lo, I'll be with you always. I mean, all throughout Scripture, we see God in action with His people. The children of Israel didn't conquer the promised land in Egypt, did they? They had to come out of Egypt. They had to get out of the wilderness. So there are processes of things that we go through and we've been through and whatever. That's just your story. But it's not your destination. It's just part of your story. Yeah, I've been through this. Okay, wonderful. Well, why are you still dwelling on that? Yeah, I was troubled with this. Wonderful. I mean, you were troubled with that. God set you free. Praise God. Don't be bound anymore. Galatians 5 and verse 1 says, It is for freedom that Christ has set you free. No longer to be bound by the yoke of slavery. 
So that means next year you don't have to deal with the same things you dealt with this year. I know there's a version of Christianity where people think, I'll always deal with that. I'll always struggle with that. But you don't have to. (laughs) You don't have to. I guess some of you want to, but you don't have to. New levels. Think about it. Do you, do you want to be burdened by the same things time and time again? No. God wants to accelerate things. So the children of Israel, they moved and God was moving with them. And they stepped into a new season. And they saw new levels as they conquered new cities. In the same way, God is empowering and equipping his people like never before. Why would God be pouring out his spirit in such unique ways here at this church? Why would God be encountering his people in such powerful, profound ways as you've seen in the past? Because of things he wants to do in the future through your life? Because of people that he's called you to reach? Because of seats he's called to fill? Region that he's called to restore? Lost that are called to be found. So God would do all of that because he loves people so much. And he wants to use you in the process. So each of you have a new level that God wants to take you to. But entry level Christianity starts in what Matthew 7 verse 7 says. Some of you think I forgot about Matthew 7 7. Ask. Here's your process. Okay, Lord, how do I get to the new season? How do I get to the new level? How do I experience greater levels of breakthrough? I've encountered his power. Now what? Ask, ask, and it will be given. Everybody say ask. How do I get greater clarity? Ask. As I've been... In different countries, in different churches, different denominations, different backgrounds. The greatest churches in the world, the greatest leaders, and the greatest Christians and people that are seeing God move in amazing ways are still doing the simplistic things the scripture talks about right here. Just asking God. God, transform my family. Increase my business. Increase my territory. Give me favor. Thank you that you are with me. There is still profound power in asking God. You have not because you, man, some of you just needed to hear that word. Hey, God, give me a sign. Ask. I'll show you. I'll speak to you. It's like the lesson I learned from a basketball coach when I was graduating college. And I was coaching a middle school boys basketball team and this high school basketball coach walked up to me and said, hey, you're graduating school. What are you going to do when you finish? I said, I don't know. I'm just seeking the Lord. I thought that would be a good answer. I'm praying. I believe in God. Which I was. But then... He was like, okay, sounds good. He saw me the next week, next week, maybe one or two weeks went by. He said, hey, how are you doing on that question I asked you? What are you going to do when you graduate? What's the next assignment? I had the same answer. It had been a few weeks. And he looked at me so confused. Like matter-of-factly confused. He said, I thought you said you were praying and asking God. And I said, I am. And they just looked at me, really confused. He said, well, if you're praying, you should be getting an answer. And then he just walked away, kind of like Kobe. Mic drop. <laughs> it was over, ball game over. And I was like frustrated, offended. That guy is a basketball, he doesn't know. He's not a rabbi, he's not a pastor. He's not a religious person. No, but he loves Jesus and he knows what he's talking about. And guess what? It wasn't very long until I started to get an answer. 
because I realized I was asking, but I didn't like the answer I was getting. Because the answer I was getting wasn't what I was expecting it to be. So I was asking God for something else. I'm like, okay, God, yeah, yeah, yeah. That door's open, but I want a different door. Okay, that person wants me to do this, but I don't want to do that. God, I'm believing for this. And sometimes the answer we get isn't what we're believing, but it's God's path that helps to accelerate things in our life. Ask and you shall receive. What you receive is not what you want. It's what God wants for your life. And then you have the ability to respond and obey. I got the answer. When I started to listen and realize God was already speaking. Most of the profound transformative moments in my life haven't been the next new revelation from an obscure thing or place. It's been the application of what I've already known that I begin to practice in my life that changes everything. Simple things like ask and you shall receive. Seek and you will find. I mean, all of us can seek here today. You're believing for something in your family, your business, your children, whatever. Okay, ask God. Seek God. Are you really seeking God? Or are you seeking God and then navigating it through man's ways? Okay, God, I'm asking. I'm seeking. Okay, honey, come on over here. Let's figure out how this is going to happen. Okay, so this is going on and this is going on. Whoa, whoa, whoa. What about waiting for him to give you the instruction and just doing what he says? And let me encourage you with this. This is a whole nother message, but some of you need to hear this word. When the Holy Spirit speaks, after you ask and seek, when he speaks, most often it doesn't always make sense because it comes in a form of what you didn't expect. Like, for instance, when you have a need, you're like, okay, we, we need X amount of dollars. We need this. We need a breakthrough for this. And then God says, okay, now you see that person. I want you to go bless them. Well, that doesn't make sense because all I have is that $100 in my pocket. And actually we needed that for something else. God says, no, this is your path to promotion. Now obey. That's not what I wanted, God. You see, it most often doesn't make sense when he speaks. But hear me on this. It always makes a difference. Ask and seek. And then he gives instruction. And it's in the obedience to what he says. Because now faith is. It's the action associated with what he says that then unlocks the doors and the windows of heaven over that situation and over those circumstances. Because one thing changes things in heaven. And God sees it. It's called faith. Faith is the currency of the kingdom because the, the Bible says without faith, it's impossible to please God. So faith actually pleases God. When you operate in faith and you move when he says move, it's like God says, whoa, hey, that one, they really trust me. That one over there, they just talk. But that one, they trust me. So this instruction is simple. How do we step into our new season? How do we go to a new level? We ask, we seek, and then we knock. Knock, and what does the Bible say? Does it say every door will be shut? No, it says the doors will be open. Does that mean every door will be open? No. The doors God wants to open will be open. But sometimes what I've found, the doors that God opens aren't the doors that I asked for. They're the doors he wants me to walk through. And then I have a moment where I decide, am I going to trust what God opened up or am I going to just wait and be like, uh, okay, God, I'm going to go over here. Okay, open up the doors. And God's like, yeah, I opened up the door. But that's not the door, Lord. Sometimes your, your new level of increase, your new level of breakthrough, your new season is wrapped up in your obedience to walk through the door that God opens up, not the door that you're trying to create. And you open up, you start the business, you reach out to the person, you call the person, you forgive the person, you bless the family member, you, whatever it is, you, you just obey. You walk through the door that God opens up. Miracles take place. You get to that new level. 
You walk into that new season. Picture yourself like this. Beautiful building, multiple stories. And you, in order to get to the next level, you have to get into that elevator and push the button. Mm, takes you up the next level. Eh, next level. In some of the world's tallest buildings, they have multiple elevators. I've been to the world's tallest building in Dubai. I had to go up four sets of elevators to get to the very top floor. Because one wasn't enough. I had to build it at different ways, different sizes. And the elevators actually got smaller as we got to the top. Like we were in a huge cargo elevator. I mean, you could fit 40 people at the bottom. Eh, 70 floors. A little bit smaller. 20 people. Eh, another 40 floors. Then we get in. Eh, until like 136 or whatever the top floor was. It was like... Then it was like six people could fit in that elevator. Because the pathway to the top isn't crowded. But it does require you stepping through the door, pushing the button in faith, saying, God, take me to that next level. And sometimes as God takes you to the next level, it requires you to kind of streamline some things in your life. Let me give you these three areas if you're taking notes or just listening to me today. Three areas that God wants to take you to new levels in, that's in your freedom, in your provision, and in your boldness. The scripture tells us in Galatians chapter 3, in verse 13 and 14, that Christ is the one who redeemed us from the curse, having been made a curse for us. And some of you are stuck at your current level because you're making excuses because of something that happened to you. And you're saying, that's the way it's always been, and that's the way it's been in my family, that's the way it was with my grandma or my grandpa or his grandpa, and you've accepted something that's a curse as normal for your life. When Jesus paid the price for the curse to be broken off of your life, Christ had redeemed us from the curse. You don't have to deal with the same stuff that your grandpa dealt with. You don't have to struggle with the same stuff that your mom struggled in. You don't have to have the addiction of your past in your future and always have mental assent to not do those things. No, because you've been redeemed from the curse because of Jesus. He gives you a fresh start, a new beginning. The curse is broken off of your life. I know it feels good to make excuses about why you are the way that you are. That feels good. Yeah. Sorry, just always that way. I, I came from messed up family. Okay, wonderful. When are you going to get over that and realize Jesus broke the curse off of your life? I come from a broken family. I remember at 10 years old sitting in the McDonald's. My mom and dad said we're getting divorced. We lived in another city at the time. We got in a U-Haul trailer with my dad. We drove halfway across the country. I didn't see my mom for a while. I'm like, man, this is weird. I don't know what's happening. I could use crutches from my past as to why I'm not going to move forward in my future or I can realize what the Bible says what Jesus did that Jesus makes all things new so what my story is doesn't have to be my story I've been married 22 years my parents couldn't even stay married 13 years and they stayed married for a while but that doesn't have to be a reoccurring theme in my life Jesus broke those things so some of you have accepted levels and said this is how it's always going to be but Jesus wants to break those things off of your life and give you a greater level of freedom than you've ever had before so in what area of your life have you accepted something as constant when God says I want to change that and I want to make it new I want to give you complete freedom in areas of provision Maybe you've settled in. This is how it's going to be. This is the way my family, I mean, no one in my family has ever broke through that. No one in my family has ever achieved that. No one in my family has ever owned that. No one in my family has ever expanded in that way. That is just a natural limitation. But you have Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit with you. So he can change those things and he can unlock supernatural provision for your life. In areas of boldness, some of you said, I've never spoken out loud about Jesus. Well, that can, that can change. Things can start new with you today. You can walk out of this place and you can be the greatest witness and example of Jesus like never before. But sometimes we're not the greatest example of Jesus because it helps, because it actually holds us to a higher standard. 
We like talking a certain way, acting a certain way, being around people a certain way, but God wants to change you. And some people aren't bold witnesses for Jesus because they have just wanted to fit in with the crowd. But he makes all things new. And he wants to unlock a level of boldness over your life like never before. Being a bold witness. When they look at you, they say, wow, that person is different. Scripture says we're supposed to be salt and light anyways. So you may as well just be salty. Like Pastor Brian, just be salty. You may offend some people, good. You may hurt some people, that's okay. They may be hurt by the truth, but the truth spoken in love brings change in people's lives. Stand to your feet all over this place. I want to pray for you. Freedom, provision, and boldness. New levels. You don't have to wait on God someday in the sweet by and by to get your freedom. Jesus already paid it. But it does require you to take a step of faith and say, okay, that's what I want. You can stay the same or you can allow God to change you and transform you. Bow your heads and close your eyes all over this place. I just want to pray for a group this morning that maybe in some area of your life you realize you don't have freedom. Maybe there's fear, torment, shame. Maybe there's failures of the past, strongholds and addictions. You don't have freedom. You don't have freedom of following. You don't have freedom of giving. You don't have full freedom of rejoicing. You don't have full freedom of worshiping. You don't have full freedom in some area of your life. And I feel like the Holy Spirit is saying, you can be free. Complete freedom. I don't need to call your name. I don't need to pull you out. But you do need to take a step of faith. God knows. You know. And you can take a step of faith to say, you know what? I'm going to settle this once and for all. The bloodline that I live by is not the bloodline of my family. It's the bloodline of Jesus that was purchased on the cross. That was given to me through his resurrection. And I want to be free. If you're here this morning, you say, you know what? There's an area of my life where I don't have freedom. I'm bound in some area, and I want full freedom. Lift your hand all over this place. You say, that's me, that's me, that's me, that's me. Full freedom over what people think. Full freedom. I'm going to be that witness on the job. I'm going to be that type of employer. Full freedom. I'm not going to speak that way anymore. I'm not going to do those things anymore. Full freedom. Freedom of every bondage of my past. As your hands are lifted, just step out of your seat and come stand with me here at this altar. This is a supernatural moment between you and God. It's, it's your now moment. Now faith is. Just step out of your seat quickly, quickly, quickly. Just come down, fill this altar, lift your hands. Full freedom. Strongholds are being lifted. Strength is coming today by the power of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name. Freedom in minds. Freedom over your family. Freedom over your finances. The spirit of lack is being broken off of your family. Broken off of your mind. New mindsets. You're going to think on a new level. You're going to eat on a new level. You're going to speak on a new level. Because it is for freedom, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. He came to give you freedom. Say this with me out loud. Say, Lord Jesus, I thank you today for setting me free of everything that is holding me back. Every area of my life 
I give it to you. The hurt of my past, the pain in my present, the fear over the future, I give it to you. Thank you for touching me. Thank you for healing me. Thank you for restoring me. In Jesus' name. Now just lift your hands. You just received from the Holy Spirit right there where you are. With his healing, he brings instruction. He's going to give some of you instruction, unique assignments right now. Call this person. Change this thing in your life. Destroy this thing. Add this thing. Whatever the instruction is, that's the Holy Spirit. Text this person. Go to this place. Give to this thing. Unique assignments are going to come to each of you now. That is the Holy Spirit speaking to you. Don't neglect his voice. Just listen. Hear his voice. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray it right now for every single one of my friends. From the front to the back. From one side to the other. Complete freedom. Complete freedom. 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 Not just an outward freedom, but an inward freedom. A freedom that brings joy and peace that brings purpose and fulfillment, greater fulfillment, greater fulfillment. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Where they've been trying to find purpose in other things, in people, they're finding purpose in you. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Come on, just talk to him right now. You don't need a person. You don't need a song. You have Jesus. You have his spirit. In Jesus' name, I'm touching and agreeing right now. The Bible says where any two or more are gathered together and touch and agree in his name, it is done. He is there in our midst and it is done in Jesus' name. No longer, no longer to be bound by yokes of slavery in Jesus' name name in Jesus name fresh starts new beginnings clarity supernatural peace let's all just lift our hands father I declare it over this church over the people in this church I declare Lord you're helping them to walk into a new season you're transforming their minds so they can walk into the new level that you have for them. We thank you, Father. Their mind is renewed. Their heart is open. Their mind is transformed. That you're working. That you're guiding and directing. I pray for strength to obey. That they hear your voice. They're led by your spirit. That through you there's freedom. With freedom comes strength. With freedom comes joy. Greater joy than they've ever had before. Faith without struggle. Not forced, not coerced, but with ease. A trust and a confidence. give you this verse as we close. I was just quickened for this verse. Why does God want to give you this freedom? Listen to this verse. Second Chronicles 32 verse 8, 7 and 8. Be strong and courageous. Don't be afraid. Don't be discouraged because of the kings of the other armies. For there is a greater power with us than are with them. So whatever the troubles are, the scripture says there's greater power with us than are with them. But listen to this. With them, it's only the arm of their flesh. 
So they only have the natural things working. Those opposing forces that are trying to bound you up in some area, those are just opposing forces of the flesh. But we don't fight flesh with flesh. We have the Spirit that conquers the flesh. And the Scripture says, with them is only the arm of flesh, but with us is the Lord our God to help us and to help fight our battles. And listen to what happened. At hearing that, the people gained confidence at what the king said. So what happens here in this place is you're leaving with a greater level of confidence because you brought something to the front, you heard something in a service, and God says, it's not about flesh and flesh, it's about you walking in the spirit over flesh, over the people, the problems, the addictions, the strongholds. And what does it do? It gives you greater confidence. So you walk different. Someone that's confidence, with confidence, you can see them walking into a room. You don't have to walk into any room and be ashamed. You don't have to walk into any environment and think you were less than. No, you are a child of the Most High God. You have been bought with the price of Jesus' blood. You are not your past. You are not your problems. You are a son and a daughter of the King. Jesus is with you. The Holy Spirit is in you. So you walk different. And when you have a greater level of confidence, that's when people begin to notice. Why did the people in Jerusalem see the followers of Jesus in Acts and say they've been with Jesus, they walked and talked different. So my expectation of you, this is the lowest level that you'll ever be. Today, when you woke up, that's as low as you'll ever be before. Never again, because you're going to a new level and you're going to have greater confidence who God is and who he's created you to be. You receive that word? All right, give him praise today.